Python supports the language constructs required for object-oriented programming in a very simple, elegant way. It has classes, methods, attributes, objects, and supports single and multiple inheritance. Here are some code snippets illustrating the evolution of an implementation of a class named book. Class definitions begin with the keyword class, followed by the class name, a parenthesized list of parent classes, a colon, and one or more indented statements. Later, this presentation will touch on the implications of a list of parent classes, but for now, the classes won't use one. The statement here is pass, which does nothing. Not very useful in the grand scheme of things, but it can act as a placeholder for future development. And yes, it is possible to create an object from this class, but the object has no attributes or methods, so it can only serve as a placeholder. Methods are equally as easy to add to a class. Methods begin with a def statement and always have at least one parameter, and that is self. It appears in the first position of the parameter list. After the parameter comes the colon and one or more indented statements. Dummy methods with a pass statement could be added to a class to serve as a placeholder, but in this example the methods open book and close book have a more useful task to perform, print a message. Add these statements to create an object, a virtual book if you will, and try out the methods. What you should see when you run the program are the messages open the book, close the book. What happened? Well, it worked. A virtual book was created by specifying a class name with the required arguments. In this case, there were no arguments. The virtual book or object was assigned to the variable a book, and a book has the type object. Once the object was created, the methods could be used and the messages printed. This is a good point to discuss what names to use for your classes and objects. A good place to start is to use nouns for classes and verbs for methods. I also have a fondness for camelback notation, which some programmers find unnecessarily verbose. I read so much code that I find it helpful when I have to review what I wrote or when I ask someone else for advice. But I recognize there are situations where the detail is redundant and extra noise on a piece of paper. So the choice is up to you. The final scenario to go through on the topic of classes and methods is passing arguments to a method. Before a method can accept arguments, parameters must be added to the method definition. They appear after the initial self-parameter on the def statement. When the method is used, only the argument needs to appear after the method name. Here's what it looks like in the book class. The new parameters and arguments are highlighted in bold-faced font. The messages that are printed are Open the book Calculus Today, written by Dr. Diffie Q, followed by Close the book Calculus Today, written by Dr. Diffie Q. The next object-oriented feature in Python are attributes, or in other words, the variables that contain state data that further describe an object. The syntax of an attribute is no different from a variable. Its location in the program and how it is referenced is what distinguishes a variable from an attribute. In addition, there is a special Python method that is used to initialize attributes for an object. It goes by the name underbar, underbar, init, underbar, underbar or initializer, and is one of the methods in the class definition. To illustrate the use of attributes, here are changes to the book class so that the virtual book is given a title and author when it is created, so that they can be referenced from the methods. The results when the program is run are the same as before. Open the book Calculus Today, written by Dr. Diffie Q. Close the book Calculus Today, written by Dr. Diffie Q. The initializer method defines the parameters that are required when the object is created, 
and the method definition requires a self-parameter. The reason for the self-parameter is more obvious here as it is used to create and initialize the attributes book title and book author that are the attributes for an instance of the book class. To assign them a value, use the syntax object period attribute equals value and each attribute is created. The initializer differs from other methods in that the Python interpreter will call the method if one is defined when an instance of the object is created. In the example, the initializer method is used when book is invoked. By default, attributes in Python are public. That is, they can be referenced from the body of the program as well as from object methods. The syntax is similar to creating an attribute, the difference being the object name is used instead of self. Here's how it would be done in the sample program today. A book is assigned the object from book and the instance variables are referenced on the print statements. The output when the program is run will be the book is Calculus Today, the author is Dr. Diffie Q. One of the risks of allowing access to an object's attributes directly from the body of a program and not through a method is Python will allow it to be changed. Add these statements to the program and the virtual book Calculus Today becomes the cat in the hat. When the methods are invoked, what you get is open the book, the cat in the hat, written by Dr. Seuss, close the book, the cat in the hat, written by Dr. Seuss. The simplest way to prevent these kinds of changes from occurring unintentionally is to develop a set of naming and programming conventions that make sense for your application and resist the temptation to take shortcuts. It is possible to design class interfaces, i.e. the methods and attributes that are defined for a class, to prevent some of these errors from occurring accidentally, but in many cases it would add more complexity than it's worth, and good programming practices would be a more cost-effective approach to use. The second kind of attribute is a class attribute. If you were to compare a class attribute to an instance attribute, there is only one class attribute, while there is one instance attribute for every object that is created from that class. As an example, here's what a class attribute looks like that keeps track of the number of objects that were created from the class. The class attribute looks more like the definition of a variable that appears within a class declaration. In the example, the class attribute is books created, and it is assigned a value. The class attribute looks more like an object attribute when it is used in code. It follows a syntax object.attribute or book.booksCreated. The class attribute can then be referenced or modified within a method or the body of the program. Here, book.booksCreated is incremented from within the class initializer, underbar, underbar, init, underbar, underbar, and then printed from the program body. Running this program results in the message, two virtual books exist. The last aspect of object-oriented programming we'll cover is inheritance. Inheritance gives programmers the ability to reuse code, potentially a lot of code. Projects that would be unrealistic to write from scratch can be completed in short order. When defining a new class that will inherit from another class, all you have to do is, is specify the parent class name on the class statement. The programmer then has access to all of the methods and attributes defined in the parent class. Here's the example. I've added the new class children's book and it inherits attributes and methods from the class book, its parent. Any instance of the children's book class will be able to use new methods from its definition, methods that replace a method defined in its parent's class, and methods that are unique to its parent. An instance of the children's book class uses the initializer 
underbar, underbar, init, underbar, underbar from its parent class book. The open book instance method that replaces or overrides the open book method in the book class and the new method read book aloud from the children's book class. Attributes from a parent class are inherited by its children as well. Class and method attributes can be used in the methods of its children and in the main program. However, attributes that are defined in a subclass of the parent are not available for the parent to use. When a method is overridden in a subclass, the parent's version is no longer invoked. This can cause problems if the parent's method performs some function that isn't duplicated in the child's version of the method. A good example of this situation occurs when the parent class has attributes that need to be set for correct functioning and the child class defines some new attributes that also need to be set. If both classes have the initializer, only the class attributes of the child are set. There is a function, super, will get you around this problem. Super returns the class object of the parent, in this example book. With that object, its method, the initializer, may be invoked, setting the attributes book title and book author. When it's finished, the child's initializer continues after the super statement and sets the new instance attribute book price to 2.0. And just to show you how it's done, um, it is possible for a class in Python to inherit from more than one class. This is called multiple inheritance. So as you can see, uh, I've modified the children's book class to not only refer to the parent class book, but also to feed in all the methods and attributes that belong to a hypothetical inventory system. For right now, it's written as just a placeholder, but I foresee a whole bunch of code that I'll be able to pull into my program that I'll be, re -able, be able to reuse. The last aspect of object-oriented programming we'll cover is inheritance. Inheritance gives programmers the ability to reuse code, potentially a lot of code. Projects that would be unrealistic to write from scratch can be completed in short order. When defining a new class that will inherit from another class, all you have to do is specify the parent class name on the class statement. The programmer then has access to all of the methods and attributes defined in the parent class. Here's the example. In the class children's book, it has listed as its parent class book. Any instance of the children's book class will be able to use new methods from its definition, methods that replace a method defined in its parent class, and methods that are unique to its parent. This instance of the children's book class uses the initializer init from its parent class book. The open book instance method that replaces or overrides the open book method in the book class and the new method read book aloud from the children's book class. Attributes from a parent class are inherited by its children as well. Class and method attributes can be used in the methods of its children and in the main program. However, attributes that are defined in a subclass of the parent are not available for the parent to use. When a method is overridden in a subclass, the parent's version is no longer invoked. This can cause problems if the parent's method performs some function that isn't duplicated in the child's version of the method. A good example of the situation occurs when the parent class has attributes that need to be set for correct functioning, and the child class defines some new attributes that are also that also need to be set. If both classes have the initializer, only the child class's attributes are set. 
This is where the super function gets, comes in. Super returns the class object of the parent. In this case, it would be book. With that object, it's, it's possible that book's initializer may be invoked, causing the attributes, attributes book title and book author to be set. When the initializer is finished, the child's initializer continues after the super statement and sets the new instance attribute book price to 2.0. Now, Python supports multiple inheritance. In this, in this set of ex extensions to the scenario, I've modified the children's book to have two parents, inventory system and book. Inventory system is simply a placeholder that I hope to replace sometime in the future with a full function inventory system that um, the children's book implementation can take advantage of.